I spent most of my adult life being a clown. Sorry. That was a joke, and I failed. So I grew up, um, and then at a very young age, joined Cirque du Soleil, and did over 2,500 performances um, during this act, uh, solo act as a clown. Then I had the opportunity in 2010 to go to Macau. And in Macau, um, I was part of a team that helped create the House of Dancing Water, which is a show that's performing still today uh, in Macau and is one of the most technically advanced live performance shows still in the world. But I'm not here to talk to you about that necessarily. I did about another 2,000 shows of the House of Dancing Water. This is me with more hair, age happens, uh, and my wife, now my wife, in the show. In this process of creating the work, working with people and trying to figure out how to create a show, I started to think, well, what is the other side of show? Well, it's business. And so I went and I ended up getting my MBA, and then I um, moved to corporate. Most people take corporate and run away to the circus. I did the opposite. <laughs> in this process now, I've been working in the corporate for a while, and I asked myself, you know, how do we work? How do we take the principles from the creative industries and the creative arts of performance and working together as an ensemble? And how do we ingest that and use that in our business? A couple years ago, I came just after leaving the performing arts on a day-to-day -day level, and I came and spoke at Inc. A little over two and a half years now that uh, Lakshmi uh, brought me back. I've done some work since then. So I'd like to share with you some of the insights that I've got. One of the main things is, is this. <laughs> we realize this, and this, this is an issue. Whenever I, I'm with uh, executives, and VPs sitting around the table, I look at all their um, watches and their expensive suits, and I think, my God, how much money is in the room right now, and why do we do this so badly? Why is the process of thinking together done so poorly? And so this is what I'm starting to explore. In China, where I'm currently based, there's a similar problem that seems to have be in uh, India, which is that management is growing too quickly. There is a time when technical skills are important when you're operating. When you start managing, that needs to shift and it becomes more about people skills. And that shift seems to be quite difficult for a lot of us to do. Millennials are now becoming managers, and the processes and the things that are important to them are changing, and we see this schism of generations between styles of management. An interesting idea, and I didn't know how to fit this in, but the word manage comes from the initial Italian word in English, um, managere. Managere basically means dealing with horses and working with your hands, manos, hands, to agitate and working with horses. And in French, ménager also means to clean or to control. And from that, we get the idea of manage. And as we see right now, when you're asking people to um, be controlled in a factory environment, that's possible. But when you suddenly ask them to be creative, to control them, that's a duality that doesn't seem to work so well. So the concept of management ultimately is shifting now as we go into knowledge, net, knowledge economies. So I ask myself, is there a better way? And I've been developing what I call um, the management toolkit. So here's how I'm going to give you three tools today based on this. When I work with companies now, I focus on three things. Aligning people's perspective and assumptions. So how do we get everybody moving in the same direction? Because when people sit around the table, there's many assumptions, right? So how do we get one people thinking of one thing? How do we get clarity of the problem? We see the big failure, I, I think a failure is design thinking. Design thinking is a failure. Why do I say that? Because that process is ultimately very holistic and goes back and forth. And by trying to codify it in a linear process, it doesn't seem to be very intelligent because we don't work linearly necessarily. To explain it makes a lot of sense. But the actual process itself is not linear. So we need to have clarity. And finally, how do we engage? How do we engage people so that they're in the room now and they're not on their phones? One thing I do is I have everybody come in and I put the phones on the table aside and then they go to work. That thing, the phone, is a beautiful object, we know that, but it's also a massive distraction for people to actually connect with one another, especially in the meeting place. Companies generally tend to focus on three main things. Talent, do we have the right people in the room? Are the right people and diverse perspectives there? Leadership, do we have the person or the individuals who are getting everybody, everybody on the ship going in the same direction. And finally, culture. It's very complex, but how do we work together? How we choose to work together defines how we are together. And these are the three areas that I focus in on with every company now. And I do this through three main forms. Visual communication, 
understanding how we collaborate, and fundamentally, creativity. Creativity is looking at a problem, in my opinion, creativity, this simply explained, is looking at a problem and being able to suspend premature convergence, which I'll explain in a second, and looking at it from different perspectives. If we can look at an idea through different perspectives and then start to jam those ideas together, that becomes very interesting, and that's where creativity can actually flourish. What is the collaboration management toolkit? First thing, make the problem visual. And in the same way, when I work with a team, I say, let's visualize the problem. It's nothing new there. But as soon as they are able to put the idea on the wall, it becomes very interesting. There's another added value, and that's what I call to allow the mice to become lions. Where I work currently in China, the quiet voices don't speak up. That can be people who don't feel that they have something to say, because they don't think it's their turn, or because they're women, or because they're not the boss, because the boss is in the room. We have these issues. So by working visually, we allow the mice to become lions, and their voices get heard. Another thing is the wisdom in the room. All of us together here, we all have something very interesting, or a unique perspective. If we can allow that wisdom, collective wisdom in the room to be harnessed, that would make something very special. And in the theater, it's the same way. The stagehand has as much to say about a situation in, with a given context as the lead performer. Ultimately, he gets chosen by the director, but we all have something to say, and we capture that wisdom in the room. Make the problem visual. So some examples of how that happens. Very basic things. Um, this is an empathy map when we're trying to define a customer base, getting people to, to um, articulate the ideas. Culture map. Um, again, understanding what kind of behaviors, what makes a good day? What are the outcomes of a good day? What are the enablers and blockers of a good or a bad day? By, able, by being able to articulate these ideas becomes very uh, poignant and powerful. Also, working visually, people have an understanding, a concept of what they think it is, let them put a dot on it and then articulate it as a group. So by making the um, problem visual, tapping the wisdom of the room. Avoid premature convergence. Most work in groups, we have a divergent phase of thinking, exploratory phase of thinking, and what we call a convergent phase of thinking. And this consolidation of ideas allows us, when we're explicit in that, we don't right away go to a result. Most of you who are executives or VPs or bosses, you're very smart. And what happens is you'll fast track to try to get to an answer. By slowing that down, avoiding premature convergence, seeking out diverse perspectives allows us a greater range of possibility. And of course, we get careful of uh, cognitive bias. So what does that look like? When we go to premature con uh, convergence, what happens is that there's a possible outcomes that we know that, that are uh, available. By Slowing down that convergence, we can open up and see more possibilities. And that becomes more interesting. This also is involved with risk and resilience. The Gaussian bell curve, which everybody knows, right, which is where the majority of people are, um, or the majority of incidents can occur, that's fine. And most work goes to that bell curve where the majority is. But it's on the ends that become more interesting. Now, if we take a Gaussian bell curve and we overlay a Pareto, power law curve on top of it, we see that in the green zones, events that are unlikely, but if they happen, they're catastrophic. Examples like that can be if we launch a product badly um, that fails. That, it's fantastic. We love failure. But to go all the way down that, that path, that becomes a plausible event. By slowing down the premature uh, convergence and allowing to see that possibilities becomes more interesting. One example in the circus was that in the show, I would, um, there was a cage that would go up 22 meters in the air, and I would die from 22 meters in the air. And I'm hanging on the cage with two other guys, and there's a fight scene. And then what had happened was, it never happened before. There was a power outage in the, all the casino. And you can imagine all the tech that's involved there. But what happened to me was I was hanging from about 15 meters in the air, and there was, I didn't know what was happening. And below me, there's water, but there's no light. So I don't know where the lift is that's coming up and meeting me, so I could land to my death. And I was stuck there for about two minutes. That's a catas potentially catastrophic event. Luckily, we designed for it. And of course, we had um, SOPs, Standing Operating Procedures, that came up for that. But that event should never happen. When did we think that there would be a power outage on the stage? What well, happened? And so by allowing that cone of possibility to widen, that becomes interesting. So slowing down premature convergence. And then finally, sit beside, not across. When you have something heavy that you're going to speak with somebody, don't sit across from them. Why? When we sit across from them, what's happening is that we're going into an adversarial conversation, generally speaking. 
Yeah? The energies of the two individuals are confronting. If I take the person and we sit beside one another and we look at the issue together, that becomes more interesting. So what does that look like? David Rock at the Neural Leadership Institute has wrote this great paper called SCARF, Status, Certainty, Autonomy, Relatedness, and Fairness. Basically, human beings, we're all like this. We want to minimize danger and maximize reward. The brain works like that. That's why taking candy and sugar is so wonderful, and that's why we have that Pavlovian response. Looked at it in another way, there's an older theory about this in neuroscience, about the trillion brain theory, which is an oversimplification, so don't take it for a gospel, but basically like this that at the reptilian level, there's a reptilian brain where things, I, things happen on an automatic response level, um, fight or flight. Then at the next level is where we sense emotions. And that's where we see, am I being respected or not? And that's the palomamillion brain, or what we call the limbic system, right? The hippocampus, the thalamus, these elements of the brain are there. On top of that is the neocortex, the neomammalian brain. That's where creativity happens. If you don't feel safe, if you don't feel respected, you're not going to get the best creative work out of your team. So we need to create that environment where people feel safe enough to play. Fundamentally, what we are doing in business and in any work that we do is play. So again, is the environment safe? Make sure people are respected. And then we can have that higher level of thinking. Sit beside, not across. So in conclusion, three takeaways. Keep your ideas visual. If you can sketch the problem, you can attack the problem and deal with the problem. The more you work visually, you tap the wisdom in the room. Secondly, beware of bias. Bias will put blinders on you, right? And so how can we get that diversity of perspective? And finally, sit beside and not across. Ultimately, we've been hearing a lot about tech, and tech is beautiful. It's fantastic. We're solving many problems, but it is the vehicle. It's our ability to play together, to love together, to think together, that really is the driver of most change. Innovation is not just a new app. Innovation also happens between us as human beings. And that's one of my biggest things that I've learned in theater, is that if I'm truly connecting with people and with my people around me, then we can create magical things. Thank you.